Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Paul Mellis. I work at, uh, at Surf Sara, which is the Dutch National Supercomputing Center here in Amsterdam. Um, head of the little visualization group that we have there. So we do scientific visualization VR for users of our, our big compute systems. Um, I'm a computer scientist. This will be a slightly different type of talk than the last two ones. So no visual effects, unfortunately, for you. I'm a long-time Blender user, and I uh, actually tried yesterday to figure out when was the first time that I used Blender. So I went through all my files on my computer, some backups, and then tried to find the oldest Blender file that I had. And it turned out to be this silly cow that I once made, December 2000. It didn't make any sense. I figured, when, why the hell would I model a cow? And then it reminded me, once I did a Christmas card in the year 2000. So it's kind of silly how that, that goes. You completely forget that kind of stuff. Uh, at work, we use Blender a little bit. Um, I would like to use it more, but it's not always a good fit for scientific data. But this is one of the things that we did as a, a scientific rendering of uh, some, some data. This is a little piece of archery in, uh, near the heart. Um, we use it for 3D printing to prepare models these days. Um, but actually, I don't want to talk about it, and I don't want to talk about cows or Christmas either. I want to talk about path tracing and uh, cycles in particular. So, uh, as many of you will know, path tracing is everywhere these days. It's become the default rendering method, mostly for, uh, well, for visual effects, for, uh, for movies, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, every major studio has some kind of in-house renderer or buys a commercial path tracer or something. Um, and you can get really great images from that. And path tracing has become so common that about a year ago, Disney released this kind of little movie on YouTube, uh, Disney's Practical Guide to Path Tracing. It's about 10 minutes long. Uh, and it explains for the layperson how path tracing works, what it is, uh, what, uh, what happens with, for example, light, how it bounces right in the scene, uh, how the camera rays are working. Um, but if you have worked with Blender or with Cycles, then this movie will not tell you anything because there's simply not any information in it at a technical level. And I figured, well, maybe we can uh, get some more information from, uh, from, from the manual. Well, there's quite a lot of information there. Uh, but still, it's text, and I'd like to see s stuff happening when I render something in Blender. So then I figured, well, maybe we can open the black box a little bit. The black box that is cycles. Show what is going on when you render something. Uh, focus on the path and the rays that shoot through the scene. Uh, it's fun to do. It's a nice little, nice little project to hack the code to, uh, to get that done. Uh, might get a little better understanding of how uh, rendering works. Show different kinds of rays, how material influences the rays, etc. Um, but you can also check things. For example, if you render uh, something and there's a firefly somewhere or a caustic that doesn't really work, you can try to find out what's happening there. Um, and it might even be useful to, uh, for example, cycles development or debugging. Um, so the fun thing is we need to hack the cycles code. Um, we want to basically add code to save paths and rays to disk and then look at them later. Um, the computer scientist in me said, well, at this point of the talk, I uh, should tell a little bit more about that, so I hope. It's not too technical, this part. So I want to store these paths and the rays that are happening, that are being generated during the rendering. Um, it's quite a lot of data, even for like a 1080p scene with only 16 samples per pixel, which is very low. You get around 33 million paths that are shooting in that scene. Um, we don't just want to store that data. We want to be able to, to, uh, to explore the data, to uh, do queries on it, search for certain types of paths, etc. Um, they also come from multiple render threads, so we need to handle that. And basically, the solution I chose was to use something called SQLite. Uh, if you're into computer science, you might have heard of that. It's a software library. It's basically an Oracle database or a MySQL database, but as in a single file. Uh, and you can link it to your program and use it from that. It's really cool. And the most important part here is that you can query it with the, the SQL language. Um, it's fast enough for what I want to do here. And it comes included with Python. So you can script it from the Blender Python modules and use it from there. Uh, pretty simple database setup, just two tables, one for pass, one for race. For the pass, we know, for example, uh, through which pixel it should. We know what sample it is, so if we have like 16 samples in a pixel, we have 1 to 16 there. Uh, we know what amount of light it contributed to the image, so we can find the paths that have uh, very uh, high uh, light uh, contribution, for example. For the race, we have slightly more data, so we know where it started in the scene, what position, what 3D coordinate. We know what direction it shot in. We know if it hit something, and if it hit something at what point. So you can check, for example, against the geometry. Um, and, well, there's a little bit of the code I wrote. I figured it should show something of that, and that's enough, actually. Um, 
But the current hack that I did is, is pretty limited. So it's a first start. Uh, lots of specialized things are not uh, caught right now. So ambient occlusion, subsurface shading, and stuff like that is all not being uh, safe to disk. Uh, there's also no support for the branched path tracing that is within cycles. A CPU rendering only. It's quite hard to get something to output from the GPU. So it's CPU only. And perhaps the biggest limitation is me because I'm not a Cycles developer. So I only do this based on what I know from one or two uh, path traces that I've wrote myself, and uh, so I might be doing some stuff wrong uh, at some point. So just to show some example, a very simple scene. Uh, five spheres with different materials, a diffuse, a glass, and three times glossy with different varying of roughness. Uh, no light sources, just white background, and a very low render quality to keep the database size down. So then we use this hacked version of Blender, get the scene, the script does a little bit more than what you would normally do. Let it render, it takes a bit more time because all the data is saved and out comes a single file of about 145 megs containing all information about the race in the past. But if you look at the raw data, it's not that interesting in this view, but this is more or less what it looks like. Uh, and we can do some queries on that just to make sure that what's in the database makes sense. So we can check the resolution, for example, you can see the SQL query to do that, and you see, well, this matches what the resolution would set to. Uh, the number of paths matches the resolution times the number of samples, etc. We can see the maximum length of the path within the scene was 10, so we know how many bounces there were. And uh, we see there's about 1.3 rays per path. So there was a bit of branching, but not even that much. Another quick check that we could do on this data is see if we can reconstruct the image that uh, Blender normally does. So here we basically query over all the pixels, and for each pixel we find all the paths for that pixel, uh, get the color contribution, sum them up, and then store them as a pixel color, uh, and out comes an image. But when you look at that image, well, this is what Blender or Cycles renders, this is what I produce, you can see mm, a little bit of the same. You can see at least that the shapes are more or less in the right spot, the colors are mm, not very good. Um, but that's actually to be expected, because a lot of what is used to, uh, to produce this image is missing all parts that Blender does. For example, how to convert the light values to RGB, how to do gamma correction, pixel filtering, etc. So that's all left out. So that's why the image doesn't match. But at least it's, it's in the right direction. Um, one example you could do with this little database, for example, look at path length for different scenes. Over here, we've got uh, the, the classroom scene from the Cycles uh, benchmark set. Uh, very nice scene, lots of reflections, a lot of light, uh, lots of shiny things. And the, the middle image shows what the maximum path length per pixel is. So these blue spots is a path length of one, so it basically hit the background and then nothing happened anymore. In the classroom scene, you can see that the paths that hit the light sources were immediately terminated, and there's also a little piece here where the the rays managed to uh, escape the scene, basically. Um, the greener, the lighter the green of this picture, the more, uh, the, the longer the pass in the pixel. So you can see, well, it's more or less an even green. There's some areas where there's more, uh, where the paths are longer. And the red spots is where the longest paths are actually occurring. And for both scenes, there's even a path of 10. And even for that simple scene, I don't know how that happens, but you get a lot of bouncing around, path length 10. Uh, this is all statistics. Um, that's not very interesting. It's much more fun to look at it within Blender. So let's do that. There's a Mac. Yeah. Okay, next one a Mac. Who did you go? And done. I only know Linux. Sorry. Uh, fail safe. Just quickly stop it. So I was asked not to do a live presentation in Blender because that might run out of time or I think might crash or something. So this is a movie that I cut together from some screen grabs yesterday. I hope the pace is not too high of this. I tried it a couple of times yesterday. So here we have the, the simple uh, scene in Blender. And for example, we can look at this green pixel in the rendering. We know the coordinates where it is, so we enter it in, uh, in the script. And here you get the paths that shot through the scene for that pixel. 16 paths, you can see them hit the sphere. And because this is a diffuse sphere, you can see that the paths go everywhere. Right? It's more or less what you expect. 
We can also look at, uh, at the glass sphere next to it. The top of it is blue, which is, of course, a reflection of the, the blue floor. Um, so if you find the path for that pixel in the blue, you can see that there are the paths. They go in the sphere, they go through, and they hit the floor, and then they reflect all the way. So that's why that pixel is blue. Now, this is best seen from the side. You can see the refraction happening. You can also see some crazy paths that exit the sphere, come back again, refract, and then go all the way around. Uh, something that even reflects internally. And there's, because the glass shattering cycles is a little bit reflective, there are some paths that immediately reflect instead of refracting into the sphere. So, um, you can pick the number of samples that you like in your image, the number of samples per pixel. Um, we can show the pixel grid on top of the camera. So this is at the near plane. You can see basically where the position of each pixel is within the image. And this is more or less what each pixel sees of the little scene that's there. And we can query the sample positions within the pixel for a single uh, pixel position. You get these little dots. And now you see that the samples are actually outside of the pixel boundaries. And that's not a bug that's to be expected. Um, because there's this setting called pixel filter width within the renderer, um, which is wider than a single pixel, which is over here. It's set to one and a half, so that's a radius of one and a half pixels. And that's why those pixels are, well, one and a half pixels wide around the center of the pixel. The pixels within, or actually close to the center, are, uh, have a, a more contribution to the image than the ones that are further away. So they, they influence the, the image more than the ones close. We can take um, the sample locations of all the pixels, put them on top of each other. So here you can see in the middle you've got a pixel, one size, uh, one pixel wide. The box on the outside is uh, the radius of one and a half. And you can see that all those pixels are, well, more or less inside of that. There's actually a few of them that seem to be outside. I don't know if that's a bug or if that's something that I'm doing wrong. Um, and what is also interesting to see is that over here seems to be less samples than over here. There's something which I wouldn't have expected. I would have expected more like a fall-off distribution. Okay. On to the next one. So we look and can look at uh, uh, the way light sources interact and, for example, caustic. So we have a simple scene here, a diffuse cube, a diffuse floor, and there's a glass sphere over there and two lights, a point light and an area light. And this is actually very hard scene to render because light will go through the glass sphere and then should form caustics. But because of the, the type of path tracer that cycles is, it's really hard to get this effect right, as many of you will know. You need a lot of samples. Um, but we can look at, for example, this very bright pixel, this firefly, uh, and check what's going on there. So we find the paths, and what you see is that some of the paths go through the sphere, they refract, um, and one or two of them manage to hit the light source. And that's where the white spot comes from. Right? One or two. And actually, it's just one of that light source, one of that path that has a very high contribution. So that is why that pixel is white. And then we can look at the, the black pixel next to it and see what happens there. And you see more or less, well, the same thing happens, but these two paths just miss it. Right? So this is, this is why caustic is hard. Enough paths have to go through the glass and then hit the light source, and that's well, really tricky for a path tracer like this. There's also a path tracer that started at the other end that should race from the light and then combine them, which is much better for uh, caustics. Uh, there's also shadow rays being traced, which are the dotted lines being shown here. You can see that they go straight toward the light. They don't go beyond the light, actually. Um, but th they don't help in this case because all these shadow rays basically hit the sphere. Even though it's transparent, the shadow ray stops at that point, and no light gets contributed to that location. And the same goes for the cube, basically. Okay. So then I figured, well, maybe you can try to model a small piece of, of opti optical fiber, just like you have a network cable or an audio cable. Uh, see what happens to, uh, to the rays within this thing. Uh, we've got a, an emissive red plane at one end. We've got the camera looking down the other end. 
And if you start to render as well, you get the red going all the way there. But as you can see, there's a little bit of black and red in the, in the same. Uh, at least uh, pixels are black, pixels are red, and it doesn't really make much sense. So we can look at one of the, the red ones. You can see a lot of the paths coming out. Right? They start at the camera, they bounce around within. This little piece of uh, geometry, just like in a normal optical fiber, uh, they come out, but actually not all of them come out. Some of them have a really strange path. Um, we've got this one, which just bounces off immediately due to the reflectivity of the material. We've got this one, which almost manages to make it and then gets reflected off. And all in all, when you look at the number of rays coming out, there's about 13 of the 16 coming out, and the other ones get stuck within the, uh, the geometry, basically. So if you want to, for example, model, render this better, you might have to increase the, the uh, path length, the minimum path length, to make sure that every one of those paths gets out before it gets terminated. And this is one of the gray pixels, and you see only two paths managed to get out. And the rest is simply stuck inside. So depth of field is a nice uh, effect to look at. Three objects. The Suzanne object is the one that the camera has to focus on. The depth of field is pretty narrow, so the sphere and the cone are not, are not uh, in focus, as you can see with the rendering here. Uh, we can look at the little gray area between the two objects. See what goes under. And now you can see that where the rays normally start in, well, basically the camera position, they now start in a pretty large area. And they focus, or actually they, they meet at the, at the depth that you specify as being in focus. So they start at wide, focus at the, the right distance, and then they get diverge again. For example, if you look at um, this pixel that is well, mostly half gray, half red on the sphere, you see that about 75% well, of those rays hit the sphere, but at very different places, and the rest of them goes past. So that's where you get this combination of gray and red. And if you um, pick a point on Zizen, which should be in focus, you can see that the rays there converge on a single point just like they normally would. So that's why it's in focus. Okay. And then finally, it's not called global illumination for nothing. Um, here we have the classroom scene again. Um, so there's the, the main area within the class and there's a little bit of a, an area next to it and there's two doors that are open that, uh, well, that the light can go through. Uh, for example, we can pick one of the faces in the room next to it and then see uh, if the light gets there or not. We can pick the face. Query the database for all the paths going through that face. We just take the first 15 in this case. Takes a little bit of time. And there we are. So now you can see that all those paths managed to get through the door, which is kind of funny. There's actually paths going through the glass here at the top. But this means that this piece of geometry influences the final result, even though it's off camera, right? which is what global illumination is all about. And it's a really final step. We can show all the hit points where the different rays and paths hit something, some part of geometry. as a point cloud. And you can now literally see that basically the whole scene in some way contributes to the final image. And this is only 16 samples per pixel. So this is already everywhere, this light. See what happens, yeah. You guys know? Okay, so that's the movie. And back to the slides. So actually already finishing. Um, so I did this for the, the two simple passes, the basic primary pass and the shadow rays. It wouldn't be hard to, to add more ray types to this, like ambient occlusion or subsurface shadowing or something. It would be nice to have not just the, the Python code that I run, but uh, a little GUI with some buttons to query the stuff. And something that I, that I came up with but just didn't have the time is it would be fun to have like an HTC 5 headset, uh, have a scene where you have got the rays flying around your head, call it the Cycles Experience or something. Maybe turn it into a game where you have to catch rays or something. Something like that. 
So that's uh, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. That's it for me.